Well, good afternoon to, uh, to one and all. Delighted to have you here this afternoon. My name is Fred Logival, uh, and I am the director of the Mario Inaudi Center. I'm also serving as vice provost for international affairs, and I am a faculty member in the Department of History. And so good to have you with us on a, on a beautiful fall day in Ithaca for this talk, uh, which is uh, part of our Inaudi Center uh, Disting Distinguished Foreign Policy Speaker Series. And if you've had a chance to look at the program, you'll see that we do indeed have a very, I think, distinguished roster of speakers in this series. It's aptly named. And of course, today's guest is no exception. Um, what we're really trying to do with this series, as I think some of you know, is to um, harness the expertise that exists um, in academia, in business, in government, in various uh, walks of life uh, that speaks to issues of contemporary international concern. So we define for the purpose of this series foreign policy very broadly indeed. Uh, uh, some might say so, so, so broadly that, it, that it, uh, it loses its, its, its meaning, but I think that's the way it should be. And I think it's one of the reasons why this series has been as successful as it's been. And so we bring people into campus several times a year uh, and have our guest give a talk like this to a general audience and also, at least in most instances, uh, meet in a, in a more intimate uh, setting with uh, students when we can, and there's also a dinner uh, uh, as well. And we have, I should say very briefly, also a network here on campus of faculty in various colleges and various departments who um, have expertise in this broad area. And so this is also part of a foreign policy network that we have, and we slot this series, if I can put it that way, into that, uh, into that network. Uh, current events class. Uh, that we're very excited about that also connects to this on issues in contemporary world politics. And beginning this year, uh, we have a um, postdoctoral fellowship program. And I see at least one uh, member of this very distinguished first class uh, in the form of Daniel Bessner, uh, one of our two um, inaugural uh, Inaudi Center postdocs, again on this theme of foreign policy in, in, in broad context. Very grateful for support that we're getting for this lecture series. And I just want to issue a, a, a couple of words of thanks to the Sao Giacomo Charitable Foundation, to Mrs. Judy Biggs, and also to the Bartels family. I also want to note that today's talk is part of the Messenger Lecture Series, which is supported by the University Lecture Committee, and that's important to note. So this is really in two, two series, I guess you could say, this, this talk. A couple of quick uh, upcoming events that I just want to draw to your attention. Um, one uh, is a li little bit awkward to mention because I'm the, uh, I'm the speaker, but Heike, I'm going to blame Heike for this here in the, in the second row. Um, she, and she's, I think, quite right to indicate that we are going to have our annual Inaudi Center, Inaudi Center Fall Reception on November 18th in Biotech G10. And as part of that reception, I'm going to give a talk. I'm going to be introduced by the Provost, by, by Provost Fox, and I'm going to speak on Global Cornell, Why It Matters. Uh, and that's going to be on November 18th at 4.30 in the afternoon, Biotech G10. And then lots of food and live jazz and wine and other things. Um, so if you don't come to the talk, at least come to the reception. <laughs> Second, uh, I want to mention that on, during, uh, um, um, during International Education Week, uh, that this is going to be on uh, that same week, November 21st, we're going to organize the 2013 Lund Critical Debate. We do this every year because of the generosity of Mrs. Biggs, who I mentioned. Um, and it's going to be... Um, I believe, am I right, Heike, at 4.30 in the afternoon? Yes. In the Statler Auditorium. This year's theme, I think, more uh, au courant than we could have imagined. If you've looked at the headlines today or yesterday, is um, death by drones. 
are they illegal? That is to say, the deaths. I was a little worried about the grammar of this sentence, but um, our, our chief organizer, Matt Evangelista, said, no, it's correct. Death by drones, are they illegal? And, they, and, that's, and this uh, uh, debate will feature Mary O'Connell of the University of Notre Dame Law School uh, and Michael W. Lewis of Ohio Northern University. He is a former top gun pilot of the US Air Force. Um, the two of them will debate drones yeah, in, in the context of American foreign policy. Today, however, um, uh, we are here to talk about, I think it's fair to say, a, a very different subject. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce, introduce Jonathan Jansen, who is Vice Chancellor and, and Rector of the University of the Free State in South Africa. He's going to be talking to us about the role of higher education in the development of South Africa. Um, and Professor Jansen is um, a longtime Cornell friend. And so it's a particular pleasure to welcome you uh, back today. I'll say a, a word or two about that in a moment. He, is, he was elected in 2010 as a fellow of the Academy of Science of the Developing World. He is also a visiting fellow at the National Research Foundation. He has received several um, honors and honorary degrees in his, um, in his illustrious career. If I'm not mistaken, he's about to receive another one, uh, which is from the University of Vermont, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, next year. Professor Jansen has published several books, including Knowledge in the Blood from Stanford University Press. He has co-authored Diversity High, Class, Color, Character, and Culture in a South African High School, published in 2008. In these and other works, he examines how cultural leaders, uh, how education leaders, balance the dual imperatives of, of reparation and reconciliation in their leadership practice. Knowledge in the Blood received an Outstanding Book Recognition Award from the American Educational Research Association. Professor Jansen serves as Vice President of the South African Academy of Science and leads major studies on behalf of the Academy, including an inquiry in the role of the South African uh, doctorate, PhD, in the global knowledge economy and on the future of the humanities in South Africa. He was a Fulbright Scholar to Stanford University, former Dean of Education at the University of Pretoria, and uh, an Honorary Doctor of Education um, from the University of Edinburgh. He's a former high school biology teacher, uh, and he completed his undergraduate education at the University of Western Cape, and his teaching credentials at UNISA, and he has also postgraduate education. I want to draw a particular, to your attention, to a particular degree, namely a master's degree from Cornell University. Uh, and uh, I'm somewhat less happy to note a PhD from Stanford. <laughs> no, it's not a bad place either. In addition, however, Professor Jansen has been with us at Cornell before. And it's always a special, special pleasure to welcome back um, friends who are coming back to us um, on a return visit and um, want to ask you now to join me in welcoming our guest, Professor Jetson. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you for coming. And it's been absolutely wonderful to be back um, in this beautiful part of the United States where I started my uh, thinking career. It was a scary day the first day, very scary. I was intimidated. You know, people here in this part of the world don't greet you when you walk past them. They all look serious and uh, angry and short-tempered. And here was this South African coming, wanting to hug everybody, and nobody wanted to <laughs> hug him back. And I was delighted to see an Alice Cook house. Nothing has changed. And uh, <laughs> so um, I tried to make eye contact with the kids. You know, they just would look at you. You know, this is very difficult uh, for me. But uh, what a wonderful place to, to, to start your career. And the first person I met was my supervisor, a man called Joseph Novak, Joe Novak. And uh, I was scared and intimidated. I was a high school teacher. Didn't think I'd ever go to university, let alone out of the country. And uh, when I got to his office, which was the education department, was in the agricultural science building or something like that. There he was, and he 
said, you must be the man from Africa. Now, at that stage, I didn't feel like telling him that Africa was a very big place with many different countries. You know, I just was, you know, so he said, you must be the man from Africa. I said, yes, sir. He said, here's a manuscript. It was supposed to go to Harvard University Press last week, but I kept it because I needed your comments on the manuscript. It was the first time in my entire life that I wet myself in public. Yeah. I was scared to death. And I went home and I told my wife, I think we made a huge mistake, you know. Anyway, I worked through the night and I probably wrote the big, biggest load of crap you could imagine. And I gave it to him, you know, and he took it. And he never said anything to me again about <laughs> the manuscript. But I realized years later why he actually did that. And it's so different from South African culture. It wasn't that he, I think if you knew Joe, he wanted my comments, but that wasn't the primary reason. The real goal is to sort of say, you come here as my equal, I expect you to speak, I expect you to have an opinion, I expect you to give me feedback. And that's the beauty of American higher education, compared to South Africa where they tell you on the first day, to this day, that by the end of the first semester, half of you will have dropped out. Uh, that's not a nice thing to tell scared students. So I want to thank you, and in my culture, you always thank your teachers, Professor Edmondson, who made a huge impact on my thinking uh, as a young student. And uh, thank you very much to Cornell University. But it's good to be here. I got some of your names wrong, uh, because you know I, 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 I apologize for that. And, and, and if, uh, earlier this year, it happened again. It was horrible. Uh, you know, one of the things you have to do as a university president, as you call people in my position, is you've got to get money. Now, people in Southern Africa have gotten onto this, you've got to get money somewhere. So now I go and I get money. And there's a very rich South African family in New York, and they live in the Trump Towers on the east side. Man, you know you're in the wrong place when you go up those elevators, you know, to the top floor. and there's some very rich young entrepreneurs and famous people. And then I saw the most famous actress, the best actress in the entire world. My favorite actress ever since the kitchen scene in Fatal Attraction, you know. And her name tag was next to mine. And I couldn't believe I was going to see Glenn Close. And eventually she came through the door. And like a bloody idiot, I ran towards her. You know, I said, Glenn Close, I've watched every movie that, you know, the, the, the normal. I have seen all your movies, you know, you might be this, uh, blah, 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 blah. Poor woman is so, you know, alarmed. And I said, I never thought I could love Mar Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> but the way you played Maggie in The Iron Lady. <laughs> and then I saw her whole face change, and I knew... <laughs> I had done something wrong. The problem is I didn't know what, okay? And so all I knew at this stage is, shut up, don't say another word. And she just looked at me and she said, that was Meryl Streep. <laughs> Fortunately, one of the few advantages of being black is you can't blush, so, you know, I got away with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with, with all of that. But it's good to be here and <laughs> <laughs> That's what she did. She just started to laugh, and that is the tension. <clears throat> but it's good to be here, and um, I want to talk to you a little bit about some theoretical work that I've been uh, sort of uh, working on now for the past few months. Uh, I work at the University of the Free State. It's in the middle of South Africa. Uh, most people, like my friend over here, say exactly the same thing when I tell them where I'm from, and they say, we normally stop at the Shell Garage and put in gas and we keep going either to Johannesburg in the north or Cape Town in the south, but nobody stopped, uh, stops in the Free State. And if you were Indian South African, you couldn't even sleep there under the old legislation. And so we had this ridiculous situation that the, the uh, Chief Justice was a man called Ismail Muhammad. And Ismail Muhammad had to drive all the way to Kimberley to go and sleep and then come back the next day. This is the most senior judge in the entire, you know, appellate division of the courts uh, and so on. So it is uh, a place that is known to be conservative, known to be very isolated, and known to be a very difficult place. You're gonna go in there and try and change uh, anything. 
And that's where I started. Now, what I'm working with is this notion of nearness, the notion of what happens when you try to get close to people who are historical enemies. Because that, for me, is really the fundamental challenge of higher education and development in, in South Africa. It's one thing to get students into university, and the numbers have trebled since 1994, but what do you do once they get there? And in particular, what do you do in the former white universities when white and black students and faculty members have to find a way of being together in a place that was quite hostile to black people uh, uh, over a hundred years. And that's where I found myself. And uh, as some of you know, we had a terrible tragedy in 2008 in which four white students uh, racially abused. Uh, five black workers twice or three times their ages. And one particular scene in that atrocity was the white students appearing to urinate into the food of the workers. And as part of this play, the workers didn't know really, because they knew the students in another sense. Uh, they didn't realize they were being abused in this video which was made uh, and entered into a competition and won the award for the best video protesting racial integration at the university. It's because of that event that I got there, I'm quite convinced they wouldn't have hired me were it not for uh, a sense of panic amongst the governors of the university is how are we going to get out of this mess that had not only made uh, the university look very bad nationally but also across the world. So I was quite eager to, to get there because I'd written a book, as you heard, Knowledge in the Blood, which in some ways deals with this notion of how young people born after apartheid uh, come to know about the past in such a powerful way that you could still have things happening uh, like the one I just described. And so for the past four years and more, I have been struggling to find out how you get close to historical enemies in such a way that they no longer look like enemies, in such a way that you deal with both the issues of social justice on the one hand, but also the issue of reconciliation on the other hand. Now the problem of being together is a complex one, because in many ways South Africans have always been together, right, for three and a half centuries. Black and white have been together. But the way in which you were together did not signify nearness. Um, it might have suggested physical proximity, but certainly not nearness in the sense that I'm going to be using it today. And so there was the, uh, the physical proximity of the madam and the maid. There was the closeness of the mine worker and the mine bosses. There was the working together of the missionary worker who ventures, uh, however tentatively, into the township to save the souls of the native. And so we are not strangers to each other. And very often, if you go to a province like KwaZulu-Natal, uh, white English-speaking South Africans would often say to you, but you know, we, work, we grew up together on the farms, the children of the farmer and the children of the laborers, and we even speak Isizulu. So you see there, we actually know each other, but actually you don't, as I'll demonstrate in a minute. Um, and so what does it mean to know? And an interesting debate broke out recently between Wally Sarota and Nadine Gordimer, in, a, in, in that Nadine Gordimer said, the Nobel laureate in literature, we actually do know each other, we don't know how to express it. Wally Sarota, the famous South African poet, said, no, 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 we actually don't know each other, and maybe we will get to know each other uh, in some future state. The problem for people looking in to this fake closeness or nearness is that people seem to get along until there is a crisis. So, for example, when you have the FIFA uh, Soccer World Cup in South Africa, you won't believe how you have these kumbaya moments where black and white South Africans are hugging each other on television, and you know one of the games is played at the uh, the great stadium near Soweto, and people are sort of 
going into Soweto, white folk, and this time not to shoot, but to, to barbecue, or braai as we call it, and you would be forgiven if you thought this was a wonderful display, you know, of nearness, except it isn't. Because the very next day we start to fight again and call each other nicknames and, uh, and, and, uh, and so on. So what does it mean really to be near? And is there some theoretical purchase in this notion of nearness that we can work on beyond simply being in the same space, geographical space, uh, and so on? Now, by the way, even that is too much or was too much for our university because, uh, as I said here before, when the students had to live together in the same uh, residence or dormitory or whatever you call it here, that's when particularly male students, white male students and Afrikaans speaking students in particular, found it exceptionally difficult because of this possibility that I might have to share a shower with you, that I might have to share a room with you. <laughs> and that, of course, that kind of intimacy was just too much. Fast forward to today, and uh, if you came to our campus, you would find that the students are okay. Every one of them, 33,167 of them, are fine. My biggest challenge is interracial love affairs. And that's a problem not so much for the students, but for the parents, because the students, of course, would come to you and sort of say, Professor, ek moet huis toe gaan hierdie naweek na die klas, en as my pa uit vind, ek, uh, my, my verliefde is siepoog, en my pa my dood maak. What that means is my dad will kill me if he finds out that my boyfriend is Sipo. Okay? It's never the mother, and I want to write a book one day on the role of the mother because I do not believe the mother here is innocent at all, but, uh, uh, but the father's pushed forward, you know, as the protector of the pure white gene. So that's what I work with, and as I said to my staff and my senate the other day, the students are fine, you are not. I have to work with you, okay? Because if you're 61 year old, has been in a white university for most of your life, it's very difficult to undo all of those mythologies, all of those lies. Um, but for young people who are 18 years old entering our university, this is not difficult at all. Thanks in part to a whole range of things that we did to enable this kind of nearness to, to happen. So I found a very powerful um, piece of thought in the work of, of C.S. Lewis. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, I've got to tell you this. Uh, my son just got married. He was born here in Ithaca, New York, in Tompkins County Community Hospital, if I recall, something like that. He wouldn't come there to force him out at two in the morning and so he was born. So this son of mine married a white girl, which caused a lot of trouble in my household. So he came to me and he said, Dad, the wedding is upon us. This is this year. You have to meet Kat's family. I said, fine. So he drove up to Pretoria to meet the enemy. <laughs> and uh, we booked the restaurant. And on the one side of the table sat the white Bartlett's, and on the other side sat the black Jansons. And my son came to me and he said, Dad, whatever you do, do not embarrass me. I said, you know me. Do, have I ever embarrassed you? And of course, he rolled his eyes, you know, uh, uh, and so on. So at the appointed time, I waited for the green stuff to go by, the salads. And then I pounced. Mikhail and Kat were sitting on the edge of the... By the way, the reason we called him Mikhail was when he was born, it was the time of the Geneva summit, and we were so impressed with Mikhail Gorbachev, and overpowering intellectually, at least, Ronald Reagan, which wasn't difficult, but, uh, it, you know, so our son is named Mikhail. So he and Kat were sort of sitting on the edge of their seats, you know. So I said to the Bartlett family, so... What first crossed your minds when my son decided to darken your doorstep? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my poor kids, they went under the table, you know, like, 
laughing. And then Kat's mother, in working class English, which I love, she said, well, I said to myself, Brenda, Brenda, I said, <laughs> are you truly a non-racist? I jumped up from behind my side of the table, ran over to her, gave her a big hug. And I said, I can work with you. Welcome to our family. You're not like all these other South Africans that believe they fell out of space. You know, in, and we've never been racist. We've never been this. Because I'm struggling with stuff. You're struggling with stuff. We can work this out. She's become a really great friend. My, my son is a very serious Christian, so he reads C.S. Lewis and quizzes me <laughs> on this great guy. C.S. Lewis said something in The Four Loves. It goes like this. Friendship exhibits a glorious nearness by resemblance. Now, I'm sure the literature people will tell me that comes from Wordsworth and not from C.S. Lewis. A glorious nearness by resemblance to heaven itself where the very multitude of the blessed increases the fruition which each, each has of God. It's a long quote, but then it says, the more we thus share the heavenly bread between us, the more we shall all have. Now this notion of nearness by resemblance is very similar to Inga Clendenin's uh, uh, notion of recognition or the recognition of likeness. What happens when in approaching historical enemies, the quality and the nature of that relationship becomes something much more meaningful than physical proximity. And so I tried this out over four years with my students. Now I have a team of 33 people. Some of you have met them, and I want to thank you again for taking on six to nine students every year as part of our attempt to break the students out of their geographical isolation and give them a sense of um, awareness of a bigger world in which difficult issues have to be worked through. And so the team does this, and I'm just going to tell you about this from my perspective. So the first is the notion of nearness beyond physical proximity. Okay. So obviously I will never meet all 33,000 students. That's impossible. On three campuses, uh, one, three hours, three, four hours drive away. But what we can do, and each one of us endeavors to do this as 33 leaders, is how to get close in other ways. So somewhere between uh, this morning and now, even though South Africa is uh, six hours ahead of uh, East Coast time, I've been able to solve quite a number of problems simply using Twitter. Okay, now I have uh, 54,000, I think, followers on Twitter. Uh, some of those come from the presidency as they spy on me, but the others, uh, the majority I like to believe are actually students from different universities, but mainly our own universities. And so when a student says to me, uh, Professor, um, this really happened this morning. We've not had hot water since three hours ago in JBM Herzog residence. Could you help us sort it out because nobody's listening to us? And of course, five minutes later, they have hot water. The issue is not that I'm responding. The issue is not the hot water. The issue is that the student whom I have never met has a sense of being heard, okay? That makes it possible to solve other problems as I'll show you in a minute. So what does this mean? It certainly means that all 33 of us, myself included, are out of the office most of the time. Now that's a very different notion of a university leader or leaders, plural, than the traditional idea of sitting in your office. I mean, some of my fellow vice chancellors at the universities, their toes curl up with joy at the prospect of signing a leave form. Now those things don't give me much of a kick, okay? What really gives me a kick is being able to, with all of these leaders, to be present in the lives of students that make it possible. Now, my students are exactly the same like the Cornell students. They avoid eye contact, they walk right past you, okay, they don't greet, and so on. No more. Because of a conscious effort to be present 
in the lives of students in order to achieve other goals. So what does this nearness mean beyond being physically present uh, in the lives of young people? Secondly, students don't change their minds about themselves and others simply because you have good intentions or simply because you have a diversity committee or simply because you have wonderfully progressive policies. That doesn't change a thing. What changes things is when you alter, as Mahmoud Mamdani wisely counseled me, when you alter the rules of the game. So what were some of the rules of the game that we changed? Well, first of all, we um, did something that no other South African university has done, certainly not on this scale, and made it a requirement that every single student uh, participates in a compulsory core in which they would learn astronomy, nanotechnology, ethics, law, history, I teach the history bit, um, which I'm busy doing there. So there's about two and a half thousand kids, freshmen, in one room. Now I have about 20 people supporting me with the teachings, so there's a lot of lights and, and stuff and uh, 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 all sorts of technologies being deployed here, but we, we keep them there and this question that I'm posing to these students in history is, how should we deal with the violent past? Now here's a problem. White students in general don't want to hear about the past. They're fed up of being the subject of scrutiny, of ridicule. So a typical white student in South Africa would say to you, listen, can we just leave the past behind us, please? And just move on. That was your problem, my parents' problem. I wasn't there, let's just get on. And of course you have to tell the students, but you were there and the reason you're living there and not there and going to that school and not that school is not an accident. And so we talk about the present past. We talked about crises that cannot explain themselves only in the present. And we go through these difficult issues, a lot of emotion, a lot of tears sometimes, and a lot of media coverage as you can imagine from the conservative local press. But we press on. And so for the students to be able to deal with a big question from the sciences, from the humanities, and so on, is a very, very important part of a broader education, as opposed to what the student thinks they come to university for, which is to become an architect, or a geologist, or a teacher. Don't waste my time by educating me. Just give me the technical skills. The problem with being technically proficient is you're producing people who are quite dangerous in a wounded society uh, such as ours. And so part of the mediated action includes the study abroad. It includes almost 100 hours of intensive training for student leaders in dealing with difficult issues. And I always find it so incredibly um, fun when the students come back and says, we've learned a new acronym in America. I said, what did you learn? LGBT. I said, okay. Uh, <laughs> progress. <laughs> and so on. And so thing, because remember South Africa's primary sin wasn't race, it was difference. It was our inability to deal with anything that was different, okay, from what was the established norm. Uh, and so on. Race just happened to be the most uh, uh, obvious a schism in society over many centuries. And then, of course, there is a nearness that has to be established in real time. So people sort of find this odd, but we spend quite a bit of time being physically outside uh, and saying to students, and this is a typical day in the week, come and talk to us about anything that's bothering you. Now, the, the menu... <laughs> goes from my boyfriend that left me for another guy to, um, you know, difficulties with a lecturer in biology 307 to um, my parents. To, but the notion of a student having a place at least once a week in different parts of the university where you can come and talk about what's really, really disturbing you is such an important part for us of demonstrating nearness um, uh, and so on. So being there, both physically and in other ways, is a very important part of our transformation strategy. My dean of students who does this a hundred times more 
uh, often than I do, uh, is amazing. And he leads a team of 20 people. They do nothing else. When a student of ours gets into an accident, a car accident, and unfortunately, 18-year-olds with a driver's license in South Africa means that they bust up cars regularly. When a student gets into hospital, we are physically there at the bedside of the student. We call the parents. We make sure that that student is fully taken care of. And so every single student who hurts, whether it's HIV positive test and the student wants to talk about it, whether it is, as I said, a physical accident, whether it is uh, the other day a student uh, said to me, my grandmother is from Clarksdorp. Now, if you know anything about Clarksdorp, if you're black, you normally drive past there very quickly. But yes, this white kid, she says, my grandmother um, is in hospital and she wanted me to tell you that she's not doing well. So I said, okay, what's your grandmother's cell phone number? So we called the grandmother on the spot. The grandmother almost had another attack, you know, when she, she heard us. And, uh, you know, the meaning to very conservative uh, people who had never before had anybody make contact at that level. The meaning for that first year student, the freshman student, is so real because of our collective attempt to be present in the lives of young people who often feel quite isolated on university campuses. Food. There's a woman who wrote a beautiful book. Uh, she used to be the cook for Nelson Mandela, and we brought her to the campus, and we talked about how she could help us make food part of the reconciliation process. If any of you are interested, I'd be very happy to give you, in fact, if you wanted a really out-of-the-box speaker in one of your series, you get uh, this young woman to come over here. And she cooked for Nelson Mandela, and her whole uh, uh, approach to food is to think of food as a way of bringing people together who wouldn't otherwise uh, do so. And so we brought her to campus and just thought about what we eat. Now, if you come to the Free State, the traditional food, this is very difficult for me, the average free stater eats red meat for breakfast. In fact, they make jokes about this. They said, if <laughs> this cannot be translated well into English, uh, but I'll try. They said, you know, you're in the free state, you know, we, uh, we, uh, we eat meat. And uh, if we need a salad, we'll kill a pig. <laughs> you know, I mean, it doesn't quite translate as well into English, but it's, it's the notion of, of tough country, uh, red meat country, and so on. And then I realized that more and more of the people I was hiring as professors were Jewish, were Muslim, were, I don't even know this word and what it means, vegan. Have you heard this vegan story? Uh, if somebody can tell me what it is, you know, I'd be quite happy. Uh, but, um, and so food itself becomes a very important, many of our Muslim uh, 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 faculty and, and students felt quite distant from the place because there was no attempt to even make or consider halal food. In fact, there was quite an arrogance initially. You know, if you come here, you will eat our foods. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a public university. Let's get that straight. And yeah, anybody can come in and require a place to pray, a place to eat foods that they're comfortable with, and so on and so forth. So, of course, we got that uh, through. Now, that doesn't happen by negotiating with people. As I found out as a leader, some of the things you have to use, the cultural ethos, which allows you as a university president to say this is going to happen. You've just got to make sure you don't do it too often. In other words, you've got to do it in the relation, because you can lose long-term gains, like building a truly democratic institution if you overuse the authority available to you to say how things should be. But this is all part of the strategy. Now, every single student here whom I invite to breakfast once a week at seven in the morning to just sit down and talk. That food is chosen very carefully. Every one of these young people has a story. Um, the young woman sitting there, I call her Catwoman, and she's the opening story in my new book, We Need to Act. She discovered stray cats on campus. So what she did as an animal science student, she caught the stray cats and sterilized them. 
I don't know if that would work in Ithaca, but you know, she just went out there and sterilized the cats. And uh, eventually, of course, she realized it's quite expensive, so she called me and said, can you help me? Could you be part of this project as the university and pay for the sterilization uh, and so on? What I liked about this kid was, number one, the notion of being an activist without anybody having to tell her this is an important thing to do. And then, by the way, she put the stray cats back onto campus to control the rat population. Now, I didn't know there were stray cats, and I didn't know there were rats. <laughs> okay? And this is part of activism. Your ability to see poverty when everybody else looks past it. It's invisible. Your ability to see a dilemma. And this is what I really, really like about my work with young people and so on. So she's come to breakfast. Lesejo Chupeng, the woman in the wheelchair there, is the head of the university's rugby team. <laughs> so she comes to my office with three huge white guys. She says, uh, Professor, we have a problem. We want to play rugby, but uh, the administration is making it very difficult because all of us are, uh, you know, have disabilities. So I would like to have the space to practice rugby immediately. <laughs> if you have ever met Lesejo, that is not a question. That is not a request. <laughs> you just bow obediently and you make sure it happens. And I absolutely love her, uh, her toughness and so on. The young lady next to her, uh, it's a very, very sad story and she told me I could share parts of it and she was almost very badly assaulted and she overcame great difficulty. Every single one of his kids has a story. And part of the role of leadership is to make sure that that student, whether it's a disability, whether it is courageous activism, whether it is overcoming a terrible assault, the role of leadership is to make those students heard, seen, um, uh, recognized uh, in order to create the kind of social cohesion that our constitution speaks about and so on. So that is how my team of 33 thinks about food as a way of bringing people into communion. The problem with the kind of work we're doing is that most people think that this approach is soft. It uh, bends over backwards to accommodate white people. Uh, it makes it easy for people who do wrong uh, to remain in the system. It's actually quite the opposite. And the person who understood that, as I was telling some of you the other night of the dinner, was the former head of the ANC Youth League, a very angry, uh, uh, not very smart kid called uh, Julius Malema. And he understood that the way, after I explained it to him, that the way in which you deal with racism, especially amongst young people, is both to indicate that it is wrong, to make sure that this is set right through the courts, etc., whatever the relief is, that the victim is sick. But then, what do you do? You bring those persons back in order to have the kind of difficult conversations that lead to a recognition of the problem. Because simply putting out 18-year-olds who committed racist acts back onto the streets is very dangerous in a country such as ours. And so a big part of what we do, both through the formal curriculum as well as through a whole lot of uh, training opportunities, is to talk about these difficult things. Now this I have seen with one of the guys who was involved in the so-called rates incident. Uh, I hired him in our marketing department. Um, if that doesn't wake you up, nothing will. So here's a way to deal with the races. Put them in your marketing department. And you know, as I worked with this kid, and he started to understand his depravity, and what he did wrong. Because as that awareness came to him, it was slow, it didn't just happen. The level of anxiety, the level of pain, the level of self-loathing was unbelievable. And he now 
helps us through the South African Human Rights Commission to deal with racism in the Free State Province, whether it's through these right-wing churches or whether it is at one of these uh, two schools at the moment that we're dealing with. And he says, Professor, let me do it, please, because they don't understand what they're doing wrong. And so truth-telling is a very important part of this difficulty. By the way, in yesterday's campus newspaper, it's one of the best editorials I've read in a university by one of your student journalists on Cornell's courage, but also how it falls short in dealing with diversity, particularly as regards international students. I keep forgetting the name of this uh, young woman journalist. Was it change? Okay, but it's a great article. Please read that uh, and so on. But it's about truth telling. And then, of course, this notion. Now, I can prove this to you if I had more time. When you work with historical enemies on terms that allow for an intimate engagement, you will change. I don't care how bitter you are as a black person, because I was very bitter. I don't care how racist the other person is. But when you begin to engage on terms that makes it possible to have communion, that makes it possible not just to be together, but to come together in the way that I've described, you begin to recognize each other's humanity. You begin to recognize each other's weaknesses. You begin Now, this is not a case for um, moral equivalence. Please don't misunderstand this. This is not a case of talking up the perpetrator. This is a case of when you approach each other, not from the point of view, as I'm whole, I'm okay, I am, I've been done in, and you, the bloody racist who needs to be brought to a knowledge of the truth. That's not the approach. The approach is completely different. And this is what I saw happening with these two kids. Now, the young woman on the right is from a place called Velcom. You don't want to be in Velcom. The word means welcome. It doesn't mean that if you're black, okay? Um, she's from this place called Velcom. It's a very conservative old mining town, but the mines have shut down for the most part in Velcom, the gold mines. So it's a very poor area. And she used to get um, very high marks in school. And then our parents both died within months of each other. And out of frustration, uh, she, and she's living on the streets as a poor white, and she has to feed, and she gets pregnant, and now she's got to feed a baby, and she doesn't have it. So she loses her bursary or scholarship, but somehow makes it into the university, and makes it into the university as a person uh, who, uh, with, with very good marks getting 90% in almost everything. The problem is she couldn't eat. There was no money to eat. My wife and I and a few friends run a project I spoke about yesterday called the No Student Hungry Project, and we gave her a food bursary. So she sits in a class and discovers that the guy next to her is from Kimberley. Um, she's from Valcom. That he doesn't have food to eat. And so instead of taking this little bit of food that she gets through the program to feed her uh, a family, that is the baby and the unemployed fiance, she uses that money, splits a little bit of money to help this guy eat. So what binds them together here is not the epidermis. What binds them together is another need, and that is hunger. And so she comes into my office one day, this is how I knew about the story, and she's crying, and in my office, I normally have a big tissue box, but that's for the faculty. Um, <laughs> but she, sta <laughs> she started to use up all the tissues, you know, in, the, in, the, in this box. And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know the story at that point. And then suddenly, while she's still recovering, he walks in. And he starts to cry, and I said, oh my God, what is this? Bring your tears to work. They come on, guys. Help me out here. What is going on? And then he tells the story of how this student helped him 
with his problem of uh, hunger and how in that process they became the best of friends and, and so on and so forth. You have to see, this is one story among hundreds, you have to see this every single day to see how that when you change the terms on which young people engage each other, they begin to look alike. They begin to resemble each other. And I think this is what C.S. Lewis means by this nearness, by resemblance that happens when you create these conditions for being together. And then most of you, or some of you will recall my favorite picture of all time, which was I have to confess to you, I am socially quite conservative. So even though in other ways I think I'm, you know, uh, so for example, I, I really, so the other day in front of my office, I find this beautiful white kid, go, and this very handsome black guy exploring each other's uh, tonsils. And, and, you know, <laughs> being conservative, you know, I sort of rushed towards him to say, like, can you please do this discovery somewhere else? You know, I did the, instead of right in front of my office. You know. and, and then I stopped. <clears throat> and I said, you know what? Um, Archbishop Tutu once told me, uh, you know, when he walked across our campus and he saw them, he said, you know what? You should give these kids more space because at least they're loving each other and not killing each other anymore. And this was where it started, when this young woman ran onto the rugby field, so happy that the lock forward in the rugby game, the guy on his knees, had scored the winning try against the old enemy, which is Northwest University. And she ran onto the field. This is a year after eight of that terrible incident. And out of sheer joy, she sort of grabbed his face and planted a kiss on his juicy lips. And I didn't see that, and most people didn't see that, until the next day when I, the coach gave me this photograph. She started all of this nonsense of our students beginning to come together. But this takes an enormous amount of courage. It is still difficult for me in some circumstances to simply move towards a complete stranger, and particularly somebody that I don't have reasons historically to trust. Now, over most of that, imagine what it means for a young person in a university that was still, at that point, seething with anger. Imagine being able to take the young people that really impress me in South Africa are those who, against expectation, against history, against the dominant political atmosphere, go against that grain and embrace the other side. There's a lot of that at our university. There needs to be more of that in the country. Those are the young people I want to work with because I think, so for example, in some of our residences, which are still largely black, there's about three or four out of the 25, I admire the white students who sort of say, even though I'm going to be a very small minority here, I am going to live there and be there and participate in that residence, those students intrigue me because I believe they have those qualities that will make them leaders in a very difficult space or a difficult place. The kids who, like everybody else, are scared of the tipping point, as the American literature calls it, when it comes to school desegregation, those kids, you know, are like everybody else. But the kids who go against that grain are the ones that really inspire me to think. And so what we're trying to do <clears throat> with our students is identify those who are able to stand up <clears throat> as South Africans in the middle of a xenophobic incident or to stand up in the middle of a lot of sexist jokes as men who are able to stand up in a group of white guys and say that is inappropriate language that you just use. Those are the students that intrigue me and obviously our role as leaders is to create more and more such students who, in a difficult country, are able to, um, to demonstrate the kind of nearness that I've spoken about. And so, I think the wonderful thing about 
nearness as a construct for thinking about transformation in South African universities is it takes the debate away from what happens in the country at the moment. In fact, there's another report coming out on racism in universities that the Minister of Higher Education and Training has just uh, uh, commissioned. That report is, is done. But it's a report that works on the notion that if you can express moral outrage and say how bad the other side is, that somehow that translates into appropriate behavior. I don't believe that. That somehow if you add yet another set of policies, okay, uh, that uh, defines appropriate behavior, that somehow you get it. That's the one approach. The moral outrage and, the, and then of course the, 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 the policy uh, impulse. Let's make more policies and hope to change. I don't believe that's how you change uh, institutions or individuals. I believe you change it by completely rethinking the way in which human beings come together in contested spaces and create a new, uh, new terrain for engagement that goes beyond just judgment and corrective action and begins to rethink who we are as we approach this nearness by resemblance. I hope that makes sense. I'm quite happy to field some questions. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Professor. Is there something a little more about the demo broader demography of the free state in terms of the pool from which students are drawn? You mentioned the university is predominantly African black. In the days of apartheid, it was the opposite. How did that transition occur um, given the wider territorial geographic demographic? That's right. So, um, <clears throat> here's some very interesting issues uh, for me to think about. Number one is the province itself, as you know, is, is, is very sparsely populated. It's not a very big province. Um, but it was occupied historically by really two groups of people, if I may be crude. The one was sort of Africana white, and the other was uh, 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 Basutu black, <laughs> for want of a better term. So the children of President Stein and the children of King Musheshwa. That's it. Okay? And so these two crude nationalisms were the only ideologies really that defined the place. As I said the other day, there was no Communist Party. There was no strong Jewish uh, movement. There was no strong Islamic you know, community presence. It was boring. It was sort of these two uh, rigid ideologies or, or ways of uh, or nationalisms, if you will. And what that meant was that the university very, very um, uh, determinedly set itself up as a white Afrikaans university for people of the free state. And in the late 90s, as you know, uh, universities were forced to open uh, the doors of learning, to, to use the theme charter, black students started to trickle in. The problem is the black students came in in very, very small numbers because of the fact that they were not accommodated in the residences. Eventually, of course, that thing blew, blew over and black students had to come to them, but it was still predominantly white Afrikaans uh, in culture, in ethos, uh, and in numbers. And then, of course, uh, by sheer, uh, uh, you know, a thrust of uh, the need for higher education in that region, Black students started to approach the 50% mark, and by the time I came there, it was more or less that. Um, we now have about 65% black students, uh, but as part of our action, we wanted to make sure that the black students did not only come from the free state, that they came from Zimbabwe, that they came from KwaZulu Natal, that they came from Cape Town, that they came from Port Elizabeth. In other words, to make sure that you didn't have this perpetuation of historical rivalries in one place. 
and especially to get students, as we used to do, by the way, from Lesotho, which, as you know, is right next door. And that's the first thing. The second thing, which has been part of my plan, is to make sure that in socioeconomic terms, you didn't have all the white students being middle class and all the black students being poor, because that, in a way, fed the stereotype. And so as part of a strategy of the past two and a half years, we have gone out of our way to get black students from top private schools, black students from the top public schools, to make sure that in many of those classes, the students would see black kids who were smarter than them, black kids and vice versa. So that was not an accident to make sure that the students were not primarily from the free state, and not primarily from those two groups of people that I, I, I spoke about. Until such time that we become normal, until such time that the students just see each other as human beings and not as an ethnicity or a language group or a religion and so on and so forth. And that has helped enormously. But the same holds for the professors. And so we quite, <laughs> you know, strategically have gone out of our way to get professors from all over the world. Because as I often say there, you're not a university if everybody looks the same, prays the same, makes love the same, you know, uh, and talks the same language. That's not a university, that's something else. And, um, and my colleagues have been open to that idea, uh, uh, and so on. So, yeah, so at the moment, I think things are going fairly, fairly well. We've not had the kind of violent protests that we used to see the first two years that I was there, I couldn't believe people would just wreck the place for fun, you know. And you won't see that anymore. Uh, but it does take a huge amount of work from unbelievable leaders, not me, my dean of students in particular and, and many others, to make, this, uh, to make this work. Now that does create anxiety, I have to be honest, amongst the right-wing conservatives, and I had a bit of a taste of that the past two weeks. You know, because people have a sense. This is not the university in which I studied in the 1960s. Well, it's not going to be again, as I told them. Forget that. Um, it is a public university with a broader mission than the historical one. Yes. If I say that I'm and I'm finding this color line to be really has no idea about the racial tensions that used to be. And it kind of breaks my heart to have to teach him about civil rights because it's like the losing of his innocence. And I just wondered when that stage might be reached or when you think that might be reached or how you would deal with the history teaching, um, whether you can tailor the history to teaching somehow so that it mm. Well, I can only, I, I, I don't know what context you're speaking about, so let me just talk about the South African context, which I know quite well. I remember very clearly at the age of seven, my daughter who was born in this country, coming to us and said, Dad, somebody just told me I'm colored. And I remember my heart dropping, you know. I said, my, dear, I said, my daughter, you're not colored, you're just a human being, okay, and, and so on. And then the next time she came and said, Dad, you know, some of my friends said, I can't come to their home for one of the girls' party because uh, uh, I must first wash my skin. Okay. Um, if you're a parent, you know, that, that stabs you at many different levels of, of your inner being. So whether we like it or not, sooner or later, no matter what you teach your kids, okay, they are going to come home with other people's stories. They're going to come home and so on. And then I've seen how my children would move towards puberty and suddenly parents who were so liberal and sort of saying, oh, you know, the kids play together and so on, they literally steer their kids away from forming relationships once they get old. I've seen this. It's not, it's not even funny anymore. So part of the problem is parents and how parents actually, what stories parents tell their children about other people. And how parents react in South Africa when there's a crisis. I always say to parents, because I do a lot of parental workshops these days, parents are saying, okay, okay, okay. You're always saying we're the problem and not our kids. So what can we do? And I said, well, first of all, if the only people that your child sees at a family, at a come together on a weekend, at a braai, that's our, the barbecue, 
That's our sort of national sport. All look like you and go to the same place of worship and so on. I can tell you now your kid is going to have problems. So the extent to which your home is open, the extent to which you talk, to which they see your friendships are not predictable. The extent to which, that's the extent to which your kid can talk back, can buffer, you know. And then it is important, this is something I learned, many of you will remember a very well-known African-American uh, media journalist called Charlene Hunter-Gold. And Charlene Hunter-Gold told me the story one day, she now lives in Johannesburg, that I'll never forget. And that helped me as a young parent. She said, you know, when I went to the University of Georgia, I think it was, and they formed the welcoming party, she says, and all these white folk were sort of shouting, nigger go home, nigger go home. She says, I looked around for the nigger. <laughs> because, <laughs> because her grandmother had placed such a sense of self and of self-worth and of confidence in her that Whatever insult you were hurling at her, you know, she looked around to see who you're talking about. And so I think part of, for me, now my problem with, with our children particularly, and most South African parents will tell you this, the kids really, including my kids, they just don't want to talk too much about the past. And I keep telling them, you've got to do that in order to answer back. But they get that as they grow older rather than. The worst thing you can do in South African schools is to push history down the throats of kids. Is to sort of tell them, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys, you know. I mean, that also doesn't help. And so part of what we lack in the country is good history teaching, okay, that enables kids to face that past, not through the simplistic uh, lens of good black, evil white, but in a way that makes those stories a little bit more nuanced than they actually, that includes, by the way, stories of solidarity, in addition to stories of injustice. Yes. I have a question. Thanks for your presentation. And I wonder, uh, just on the structure of higher education system in, in South Africa, you mentioned, so this is a public school, but what is the, uh, in general, the role of public schools in relation to private schools? And, and how do they, you know, how do you say different contributions? Uh, in the and, 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 and I just realized our languages are not the same. So when you're talking about schools right now, you're talking about universities. universities. Yeah, okay. Um, we don't have many private universities. In fact, we might have two or three, and they're very, very small. One of which is Monash, but you'll find Monash everywhere, the Australian <laughs> university, with very, very few students, uh, etc. So the bulk of the system, really, 95, 96% of students are served through this 23 public universities, and that's where the game is played. And unfortunately, those public universities still reflect their history. So the historically black universities, with one exception, are still more or less, you know, as disadvantaged in terms of resources, in terms of where the top professors go, and so on and so forth, compared to the historically white universities. Yeah. Yeah, I was curious, you talked about the influence of parents and the older yeah. generation and the effort to have overcome that, but what about the role of media and the imagery that you have? Oh my God, don't, don't take me there. Um, I've got some marks on the back to show you. The media in South Africa, there's these two groups actually. The, the Afrikaans media is particularly dangerous in South Africa. And the reason is every region, like where I live, there's a small Afrikaans newspaper. In Cape Town, there's an Afrikaans newspaper. In Johannesburg, is a different one. But they're all related through a company called Media24. And what they do is to exaggerate the stories about South Africa. So everything government does, by the way, I must say sometimes I get a feeling that's the way you guys treat Obama as well. You know, um, so everything government does is it's incompetent. It's, uh, now, some of those things are true. Some of the, cor the corruption is absolutely true. But when you begin to exaggerate, and there's nothing good happening except the bad stuff, it feeds into a racism, I think, you know, that, that we need to, as South Africans, really talk about. Um, I think the white, uh, the, 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 the rest of the press, the English press, 
uh, sort of as two groups. You know, there is the traditional English press like the Sunday Times, and then there's the black English press like the Soweto and, 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 and so on and the City Press. Um, and there you find something very interesting, and that is an attempt to discover where the line is between legitimate criticism, you know, uh, of the state and, uh, and otherwise. And nowhere was this more evident when uh, the coverage of the presidential penis, you might have heard of that particular saga, was at stake. And the editor, Fira Lafferty of the City Press, actually took down the picture from the website, which was a huge mistake, as I told her many times, and as she now realizes. Um, and so, and, and, and the question that was posed by our most prominent journalist, Justice Malala Tufirio, on a radio show, I'll never forget this on television, was where's the line between respecting human dignity, in this case the president and so on, and the right to write anything? And Fidel's answer was classic. It was, we don't know yet. And that's what we're trying to do is where in South Africa, remember this is a young democracy, how do you begin to define that space for legitimate criticism in what is still a very conservative society? Yes, sir. Yeah, I know you have a question on higher education. Mm. Where, to some extent, people's minds are the set. I can't define this one mm. in the areas. What I want to know is what's going on at elementary or preschool levels. Because mm. for now students, for example, two summers ago, built a school in Oslo City, in Hansburg. Oh. So we were even careful in terms of selecting the color of the paint so that every kid sees himself or herself in whatever we do with those materials or colors and so on. That is the young kid where this issue of nearness comes perhaps very naturally if then right at that age. So my question is what's going on at that level? Yes. Well, first of all, the, the, the primary problem we have in our schools uh, it's not for me race relations. Because remember, 80% of the schools are still black. And 20% of the schools are more or less integrated in different ways, right? Those also happen to be the schools that are lower, upper middle class and functioning well. But 80% of the schools do not function well at all. They're dysfunctional. The teachers don't show up every day. The unions run a riot, you know, over the schools. Uh, the principals are not always present. Um, there's no rhythm and routine to the timetable. Those schools preoccupy a lot of our time as a university, by the way, and a lot of my personal time, just trying to make those schools work. So the primary problem there, from the point of view of parents, is how can I just make sure that my kid does well academically? How can I make sure they get through these 12 years and qualify to go to, to college or university? That's the primary problem there. And because of this being a predominantly black country, of course, those schools will remain predominantly black, the 80%. But in addition, those schools are, with few exceptions, very, very dysfunctional. And that is a major crisis. And one of the reasons black students are so angry is when they come to university is they don't have either the academic preparation or the capacity, you know, in terms of language, to be able to, to, to do well. And uh, we've got different ways of dealing with it, but to, to change the country's 29,000 schools, you need a government that understands how serious that problem is. The problem is every single cabinet minister has their children in those 20% of schools, and most of them in private schools. So there isn't, as I often write, and you can imagine the feedback I get from those in power, uh, there isn't really a deep concern about other people's children. There's the pretense, you know, but there isn't. And until we get that right, uh, remember half a million kids, uh, that's more than half the kids drop out between grades one and 12 and they drop into gangs and all kinds of um, dangerous activities. So that's, I know South Africans don't like the metaphor, I don't like the metaphor of the ticking time bomb, but if there ever was a ticking time bomb, that's it, getting the school straight. Yeah. 
Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I, you may not have done the study of all the universities, but if you were to give a sense of what is happening, uh, is this kind of approach something that you can say is happening elsewhere? No. No, the predominant, the predominant mode of engaging these issues, in, uh, if they're engaged at all, is through what I call moral outrage. That every time you pretend you're shocked at a racial incident and then you must put in place a strategy to end it. There isn't a deep, long, you know, there's just this notion of good guys and bad guys and, you know, we'll penalize you if you're bad. There isn't any of this thinking. I now go around to all 23 universities talking about this stuff. Uh, not just in racial terms, but in ethnic terms. You know, what does it mean at the University of Lampopo, uh, where there's a very strong sense of some ethnic groups? Now, it, it, it sickens me that we still think that way, because part of the struggle was not to think that way. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, these are very powerful uh, triggers for, 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 for conflict in, in many of our universities. But there is no attempt, trust me, to even begin to think in these directions. It's just nab the racist, put a policy in place, and that's it. Yeah, it's as crude as that. And you'll see that in the next report coming out as well. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Over back to you. So, uh, yes. Uh, I want to um, thank you, Mr. Johnson. It was, uh, um, so stimulating. I, 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 I will predict with a great degree of certainty that you will never hear another lecture in which C.S. Lewis and a particularly steamy scene in Fatal Attraction are mentioned uh, within a minute or two of one another. But, uh, but more seriously, I think this concept of nearness uh, that you described and, and the, mary, the various manifestations uh, as a fellow administrator um, you've given me a lot to think about, and I thank you for that. I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, and again, uh, we look forward to seeing you at, uh, at, at future events. Uh, join me now in thanking Professor Jackson.